I saw an article about the Iditarod that's coming up in March, the famous dog sled race in Alaska, and I thought I'd put together a route for it, and it looks like it'll be pretty fun to fly, so I thought I'd do a preview. The actual route as the crow flies between checkpoints is about 690 miles, unlike the 11, I think it's 1156 is what the actual route is. This is the north route. There's also a south route on odd years since 2024 is an even year this is the one we've got now i don't know much about the iditarod air force but you don't think about the fact that somebody has to be at all these checkpoints and if we switch to satellite you'll see there's anchorage and that's the end of civilization pretty much but there's little airstrips well this happens to be one with a snow landing i've chosen to x cub with skis any of the skis aircraft to be fine but as you go through here essentially these bush pilots just have to fly everything in and out including you know the dog food the hay the people to and from these checkpoints they use the aircraft for bringing injured dogs back to anchorage all along the way it was really kind of interesting i'm not sure how they dispatch it all but from the photos i saw it's all a bunch of cubs and cherokees and cessnas and all the usual bush planes anything you can strap skis to and then a bunch of caravans doing the heavy lifting moving hay and dog food and food for humans all that sort of stuff and you'll see most of the checkpoints have some sort of airstrip or a lake which presumably will be frozen in March to land on but you can see the resolution of the imagery this is so far in the outback you can barely tell it's an airstrip I actually had to use the website to find a lot of these. The route came from the Iditarod route and I actually had to go through and read some of these descriptions to figure out where the checkpoint actually was out in the middle of the wilderness. If you wanted to chop this into sections, it's got all the iCal codes for anything that has an iCal code, anything that doesn't, it has the checkpoint number from the Iditarod and I'll include a link to the Iditarod webpage so that you can look at all the descriptions along the way. It's Anchorage to Nome. If you're going to fly it point to point to point, it's 690-ish miles through the Alaskan Outback. Let's go ahead and fly it. So we're starting at Anchorage International. The actual dog sled starting point is in downtown Anchorage somewhere. I didn't actually look at where it is, but as I mentioned, all the waypoints are basically from airstrip to airstrip to airstrip, not necessarily the path. You'll have to go look on the Iditarod website to see the actual path. The first leg is just over Anchorage, and in fact, the dog sleds run right down the main street, I guess that's Highway 1, out of town, and then ends up at Campbell Airstrip. Malamute Drop Zone is a dead giveaway for a stop on the Iditarod. The article I was reading was about the Iditarod itself, but as a flight sim enthusiast, it caught my attention that the Iditarod Air Force is a thing. From what I gathered from the little bit they talked about it, everything gets flown out to all these checkpoints, from the supplies the teams need to the supplies the race judges and race staff needs. They've got veterinary services at all these checkpoints. So it's a thing. It must be a logistical nightmare. I don't know how they handle it. I guess they probably have their own sort of air traffic control dispatch because there's you no know, towers really along the way. But I would guess they have to coordinate which aircraft are going to which checkpoints, not to mention any emergency calls they might have to make to evacuate a dog or a driver or a musher, I guess they're called. There's Campbell Airstrip. I didn't find a name for it on the Google map, but that's clearly the airstrip. From what I understand, there's still lots of crowds over this part because it's so close to Anchorage. So I assume that's where all the, the teams camp the first night and probably a lot of fan events and that sort of thing. There's a Malamute drop zone marked on the map. What they do is if dogs get injured on the route, they said they flew them back to Anchorage, but I mean, this is pretty close to Anchorage and then the dogs end up going to a women's prison where the women in the prison take care of them and they just live out back they live just under a basically a carport behind the prison until the race is over and their owner retrieves them but the running joke was if they drop out they go to prison so willow airport's 24 miles 
as the crow flies, but the dog teams have to go all the way around. I'm just flying across the sound here. They've got to go out across the uh, Kinnick River over here. My strut's in the way, but I think that's the Kinnick River Valley right there. And the dog teams have to go all the way out and around and then back on track to get to Willow. Their actual route goes, uh, from what I saw, goes out this way and along this ridge line and then out to Willow. So this is one of the places that we're probably cutting 50 miles. Anchorage to Campbell Airstrip was only 11 miles, but then it's another 42 miles out to Willow for the dog teams. For us, it was only 20 something. Oh, the Mushers Hall of Fame. I guess we have to go see that. I mean, we're flying the Iditarod. We have to go see the Mushers Hall of Fame, which should be right on our corner of this little lake here. There's our Mushers Hall of Fame, and I see a bunch of little dog houses out behind. I did change the weather, as you can see. I, I maxed out the snow, and I dropped the temperature down around zero-ish. So we're passing Big Lake. There's an airport here as well. The mushers would actually be over along the ridge line over there. They would have had to go all the way around. And the trail that I saw on the map kind of follows along the foot of this ridge up to Willow, which is where we're heading. I'll also include a weather file. If you're going to download it off the website, you'll need to do one thing to use the weather file. I'll show that when I land. I'm not going to fly this whole flight. So actually, I'll also show you how to create a new flight to pick up where you left off. So I'll show you a couple things at the end. So that's Willow Airport. It looks like a full-on airport with facilities, maybe? At least fuel. That's mostly what I want to do on this first pass. So I want to check out all the airstrips. Oh yeah, there's fuel. Check out all the airstrips along the way and then come back and do some of these legs with the caravan and see how many of these airstrips you can get onto with a caravan. Because from what I saw, they go through a lot of hay and dog food and basically Cessna caravans do essentially all the heavy lifting not just Cessna caravans but it's all bush pilots and bush planes and a lot of caravans in the photos I saw I've centered the push pins in all the airports so if you really want like the ultimate bush trip you could open the Iditarod web page and say we're coming from Willow to Yetna Station and you can literally follow the same directions that the mushers are using to get between if you want to actually follow the trail itself which I probably will do at some point on at least some of the legs in particular I think there's the Independence Creek run back through here maybe that I wanted to just check out and see what the terrain looks like from the air but you can follow the actual trail between all the checkpoints on the Iditarod website that was how I had to find some of these checkpoints way back in the wilderness I think here yeah and here and maybe even some of these through here were essentially unmarked, no trail, it's just a, a piece of ground in the middle of nowhere. I've got the temperature cranked down below zero and it's March, but the waterways aren't all frozen. I'm sure in reality, in Alaska, in March, all of these lakes would be frozen solid. Let's double check. So I've got the snow depth maxed out and temperature at minus 13. I mean, that's plenty low enough to keep most of these little lakes frozen. I'm going to check out the landings, but there's a couple of them where there is nowhere to land or it doesn't appear from the satellite imagery there's anywhere to land except on a body of water. So it might make more sense to just run this with floats. Well, see, some of these bodies of water are frozen over. All those little lakes appear to be landable. So I guess we'll see the specific ones we're looking for. Finger Lake is the first one. That's probably as far as I'm going to go on this trip. Because this is 600 miles, I'm not going to fly the whole thing. I just wanted to check out maybe the first third of it. I'll probably stop at Finger Lake. Well, I guess it'll depend. 
Yeah, see, Finger Lake is one of the ones that didn't have an airstrip. So if the lake's not frozen, what's the next one? Rainy Pass. Oh, there's a mystery airstrip there. <laughs> Grainy. Well, oh, that might be fun. We'll see if Finger Lake is frozen, though. So we're coming up on Yetna. Supposedly, there's a little cabin here. The Yetna Station Roadhouse. It'll be down there somewhere. Oh, it's going to be on the other side of this loop. If you're going to land here, you're going to need floats. It should be on this shore. There it is. The Yetna Station Roadhouse. So apparently if you're a musher, that's where you can grab a meal. And probably the race judges and veterinarians and everybody else. Bush pilots. See this next leg. Oh, it's only 19 miles. Again, probably a lot longer for the mushers. Let's see. Yetna Station to Squintna is 30 miles. But you can see it tells you how to follow the river across to the South Bank. Oh, I guess they cross over at that point. But according to the narrative, they stay on this side of the river, which is becoming the wet, I would call it the west side. But at Yetna, it was a north-south crossing. That may be our trail right there. You can see it kind of winding through the snow, the snow winding through the trees. Let's see if we can pick it up over here. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, I'll bet you those are pieces, at least, of the actual Iditarod Trail that they follow. So here's Swentna. Looks like another full airport with facilities. Is that fuel over there on the other side? I don't know. I don't see fuel. So no gas at Sweat now. Finger Lake's the next one where I actually want to land. It's only 23 miles, which by Alaska Bush pilot standards, I imagine 23 miles is nothing. This might be fun to do in March with live weather turned on while they're actually running the race. Or maybe it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> oh, do I have to get up over? Yeah, I do. Well, I guess I could go around, but I'm not going to. That's actually the first time I've had to climb above a thousand feet. I'm up at 1500. Guess we'll hang out here for a while. Memory serves, Finger Lake is right up at the foot of these hills. Yeah, kind of, I guess, up in this here. See if there's somewhere to land. Make use of our skis. So I wanted to zoom way in to get a quick look at the contour line, see where our elevations are. I think that's Finger Lake right up there. Yeah, it's a little U-shape, and I think our lodge is right along here, which means no landing on the lake. But I like this little area right here off my right wing. It looks like that probably these two lakes. This is probably a good one to land on, right off the tip of the finger lake there. Take a look at it. Or again, you could switch to a, an aircraft with floats, but the problem with floats is the extra drag is kind of a drag. And it looks like there's plenty of snow, some little trees and stuff. But this side of the lake, there's a nice long one over there too. I think I'm gonna try this side of the lake because it technically, the lodge is right here. Mainly, I gotta better slow down in a hurry. And then I'm just gonna follow the river into the lake, I guess. Well, not really. Guess I'll put my landing lights on, put my skis down. That actually looks pretty good from here. Oh, there's our lot, sure enough. Maybe now's not the time to sightsee. Oh yeah, this has got lots of room. Whoa. And if I can be slick about it, kind of get turned around. Yeah. There we go. And from here, you can take off. Actually, we can pick where we want to spawn. Let's say I want to spawn right here where I left off. What I can do is just drop a pin. Here, let's zoom way in so it's super exact. In fact, I'm going to move myself back, and then I don't need to do anything with this. I just want my latitude and longitude, and copy that to my clipboard. And when I open my flight settings, now I can just put in my latitude and longitude, 
Now that's latitude and longitude I just pasted in. So now I'm gonna cut the longitude out, paste it here. And then notice I left a little comma. There's a comma between them. You do wanna make sure you get rid of that. Could just spawn in flight if I wanted to. I could set it to flight cruise, set my altitude and heading, and say I'm not on the ground. But I'm gonna just say I'm on flight runway. Heading, I'm gonna call that 250-ish. And that's it. And now I'll save it. I can just put, say, one on the file name. And now I'm going to spawn actually back here. When I come back tomorrow or whenever and I want to fly the next leg, I'll load from my temp directory. And it'll be the exact same flight plan, except my spawn position is here instead of back at Anchorage. You will spawn where you asked for in the grass in this case. Now, I actually told you wrong, I had to spawn twice. Because we're in the middle of a flight plan, I have to uncheck sim on ground so that flight simulator knows I'm in progress. Even though I'm really on the ground, if this checkbox is checked, it's a little counterintuitive, but essentially what that tells flight simulator to do is grab this iCow, this runway, and this state and place you in the airport. Even though I really am on the ground, you have to uncheck the sim on the ground checkbox if you wanna just spawn in a random spot. Now, if you want to use my weather file, this path is going to get saved with the flight plan. You may have a G drive, but this may not be the same place where you wanna save your file. So let me just share it real quick. Just so you can see, when you go to download this flight, it's going to download a zip file. Let's open my downloads folder. So once I've downloaded the file, I've got a zip file here. And if you look inside the zip file, you can see we've got our flight plan files and we've included a WPR file, which is our weather preset file for the Iditarod. But what's going to happen when you open it on your computer it's going to still say G flight plans working I did a rod WPR which is is valid on my computer but it's probably not valid on your computer so what you're going to want to do is save it as something else so you know save it out of your downloads directory into some other directory when you save it into a directory notice it's not the temp anymore I mean G is where I save all my flight plans but it the point is it updates the path for your weather preset file when you save the flight plan when you first downloaded it and unzip it if you just unzip it and open it directly in Microsoft Flight Simulator it's not going to be able to find this file all right normally that's not an issue but since this is the Iditarod flight and you probably want a snowy day you can go ahead and download the preset file and that's how to use it this flight plan will be available to download at simflightplan.com I'll include a link to it in the description box hope you enjoyed this maybe I'll do another one we'll see what kind of scenery there is to see on this next leg I think down in here Independence Creek's like a real famous section if you enjoyed this please like and subscribe